Okay, Chair, we're now going live. You can begin the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Arts and Culture Forum meeting on the 20th of January 2022. I'm your Chair, Councillor Joe Wibley, and I'd also like to welcome anyone watching the meeting via live streaming. Based on a decision of the Council to continue virtual meetings until the 11th of May 2022, I'd like to remind both members and public attending or watching that this council has delegated much of its decision-taking powers to our senior officers. Consequently, depending on the res uh, relevant legislation involved, some of this meeting, which is being held remotely, will be on a consultative basis only. We will continue to adhere as closely as possible to the procedural uh, rules detailed in our constitution. Uh, the meeting can be viewed live online and will be recorded. So please bear this in mind throughout the meeting and I remind colleagues to be careful with their language and that the code of conduct applies throughout our meeting. And we reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant disrupting the meeting by whatever means. In the event of a break in the internet connection or a power cut, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we're not able to, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. And please check our committee page on the website for details. Members, please make sure your phones are on silent and your microphones are muted at all times when you're not speaking uh, in the meeting to avoid any background noise levels. Keep points short and do not repeat points that have already been made and do not interrupt. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic hand and wait to be called. Uh, all councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Any members of the public who want to view the agenda can do so by visiting the website www.eastdevon.gov.uk. We will now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. So when you hear your name, if you could unmute your microphone, and when you've confirmed you're here, please mute it again. Alicia. Okay, so we'll begin with Councillor Wibley. Uh, I am very much present. Okay. Councillor Briggs. Councillor Buchan. Yep. Yeah. Councillor Carrigan, Councillor Cole, Councillor Davies, just sent us apologies. Uh, Councillor Brewster Saram. Present, thank you, Anthea. Councillor Hookway. Present, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Present. Councillor Moulding. Present. Councillor uh, Councillor Pangs has sent her apologies. Councillor Rylance and Brian Norris. I think we've seen Brian. Could you just confirm that you're present? He's on mute, so he's here. Yeah. It's just for the recording that he can confirm that he is present. We'll get him to come back. We'll, we'll ask him again in a minute. Um, so we are core at chair. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so agenda item one is public speaking. Sorry to interrupt. I thought I was on this committee from Sidmouth Town Council. Um, I think you're a substitute for Sidmouth Town oh. Council. Oh. <laughs> but what? as long as we've got somebody from Sidmouth, you're welcome to you're welcome to be here. Oh poorly. All right. <laughs> okay. To be fair, John, Substitute is my favourite song by The Who, so it's a good thing to be. It's a good thing to be. Okay, so agenda item one, public speaking. Um, as far as I know, and Olivia, if you could confirm it, there is no members of the public wishing to speak. That's correct. So agenda item two um, this is the appointment of a vice chair. Um, I'd like to invite nominations from the forum for the position of vice chair. Um, and that's because our co-opted community representative, uh, Sally Twist, has stepped down from the forum and I would like to thank her for a time and valuable contribution uh, to the forum over the years. So could I uh, ask for any nominations from members of the forum for the position of vice chair? I will look for hands. Somebody. This gets awkward. <laughs> well, I'm happy to do it if no one else wants to do it. Okay. Um, well, if am I able to nominate 
Nick? Yep, and you need a seconder as well. Okay, I will nominate Nick. Would anybody like to? I'll second. Thank you very much. Although, sorry, Vicky, I just double check. Oh. You're a member of the forum? Oh, yeah. now you're asking. Probably not. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> just, right. just double check there. So you can't second, I was, I'm afraid. I was so close, Joe. So close. Sorry. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Okay. <laughs> so we need another forum member. I'll second. Yes. Okay. Sorry, who was that? Sorry. Colin Buckham. Okay. okay. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a proposer and we have a seconder. Um, would anybody like to comment on that at all or any more nominations at all? Okay. Um, so we'll now take a vote, I guess, Alicia. Yes, please. Um, so if you could, voting will be done uh, by committee members only using the yes or red no buttons at the, um, at the bottom of the participant list. That's not where it is. Uh, so green ticks and red crosses, basically. Um, and if we could, uh, if you could, if we could do that vote now. Okay, Chair. So so far we have six uh, votes for none against and no abstentions. So that's the vote carried. Cool. Excellent. Welcome aboard, Councillor Hookway. <laughs> okay. Uh, right, okay, so uh, agenda item three is the minutes of the previous meeting, which is uh, page three to ten in the notes. Um, does anybody have a comment on the set of minutes from the 24th of February? That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, 24th of February 2021. Uh, if you wish to comment on them, if you could raise your electronic hands. Um, otherwise, I will take it as an indication you're happy to recommend approval to senior officers. And I see no hands. Okay, so thank you. The minutes of the previous meeting are recommended. Um, Alithia, agenda item four is apologies. Um, if you could give us those, that would be great. So I've had councillors Davy, Whips, Hoonson and Pang. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, agenda item five is declarations of interest, which will be and by a roll call among committee members. Olivia. Okay, so when I read out your name, if you could just state which item on the agenda it might relate to, whether it's personal or prejudicial, and why you're declaring that interest. So, Councillor Wibley. Uh, none, as far as I can tell. Councillor Briggs. Councillor Buchan. Councillor Kerrigan. Councillor Cole, Councillor de Saram. Uh, Exmouth Town Councillor, for if, if, any, if it should come up. Okay. I, yeah, I guess that's me too, Olivia. Okay. <clears throat> um, Councillor Hookway. None that I can think of, thank you. Councillor Lewis. Uh, Budley, uh, Budley Salterton Town Council. Um, Councillor Moulding. Um, uh, maybe on item seven and item nine, as I am president of the Axminster Musical Theatre, um, a trustee of Axminster Heritage Limited and a president of Cloakham Lawn Sports Centre. Um, Thank you, Councillor Rylance. Not present. Um, and Brian Norris. So I think Brian's still on mute. So, Brian, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, Chair. He's in our participants list, but his video isn't on and neither his with his sound, so he may have dropped out of the meeting. Okay. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with that if he... Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, so agenda item six is the East Devon uh, AOMB culture update, which is page 11 to 34 in the notes. Um, and we'll receive a Nature Connections presentation from 
Emma Maloney. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Um, Alethea, are you, am I sharing my screen or do you have the presentation there? Um, if, could you share your screen, please? You're yeah. a co-host, so you should be able to do that. Okay. Is that working? Lovely. Um, it's all good, Emma. Okay, I, I sort of haven't got it on full, have I? There's a little button at the top you can press to do that. This, or do you click on slideshow. Okay. Should work like that. Right. Oh, thank you. Is that um, across yeah. the part at the top? Um, so I'm presenting here just as a freelancer who delivered a project from May 2021 um, for the AOMB. But also, I've met. I know many of you, and it's nice to see you all because I was working at THG until a couple of years ago. So, um, and it, this segued on really well from a lot of the work that. THG have been doing with the AUNB. But what I'll talk about is just specifically this project. Um, AUNB pledged in 2015 with the Colchester Declaration to increase the scale and pace of delivery for nature. And the three ways they're doing that are nature recovery plans, species recovery action plans. And where this project comes in is through engagement with nature through projects and events. Um, and specifically, interestingly, that's called they, they wanted to see the National Association of AOMBs uh, uh, emotional connections to nature um, because this would increase a sense of responsibility in the public. So this is where this project came in to facilitate kind of hands-on physical connections to nature in new ways. And we chose to do this in Hartford Woods. Um, so I'm gonna just briefly in five, 10 minutes, just talk you through the project. Why Hartford Woods? because of the links to the, to the THG activities that have been happening there. I'll come back to that in a minute because of the, the strong connections with the landowners. So Clinton were on board and supportive. Um, there was good access and because we've got the village hall there, which is a great resource in terms of a base to work from. Um, and also you've got several communities there and it was somewhere that the AOMB hadn't focused on much before. You've got various rural communities who might otherwise, otherwise not have strong access to cultural activities. So this is the list that I'm going to go through. Partnerships, who we commissioned, um, how it linked with new partners like Active Devon and, and also funding because it's interesting to see how something like this, this um, is funded. So back to the THG link, THG have, had, uh, have worked with the AOMB closely since 2017. Um, and they inst we installed at that point some little temporary activity boxes. And Anna Arusi and I walked through the woods to see the engagement about these in March after the, first, after the second lockdown. And it was amazing to see with these activity boxes that had artist prompts encouraging people to kind of write or do some forest bathing, which is sort of like meditation or make it write a poem. The engagement was, it was wonderful. There was such, um, there was kind of dialogue, conversations, people writing to each other. The books were full up. So we thought it was a really good opportunity to install some permanent. So th these THG paid for and commissioned and, and uh, got these these permanent wooden boxes installed into Hartford Woods. Um, they've got artist prompts and um, little activities with some with materials in so that it's a it's a great long term way and low cost of providing arts engagement for people all the time to encourage people to come back, walk, explore and have new experiences. And we thought this project could um, develop this by putting new prompts in. So we've got the artist prompts, we've got eight boxes, you can see on the map where they are, and this project aimed to fill more with, with community prompts. So take it beyond the artists and also have community schools and other people um, with their suggestions. So here, just to give you an idea, here are some of the little waterproof notepads with some of the responses on them. And 
what's great is the social media as well. You get, um, it's kind of like a free, it's free and ongoing in terms of this is how people have engaged with the boxes and shared it. So it's fantastic. The THG and the AMB can just keep showing this and sharing and the public themselves become a vessel for marketing the idea. So between May and July, we started with £3,000 from DEFRA, worked up a Arts Council project grant for about £8,000 and then started to work with schools. So right at, right as schools were able to kind of come out of lockdown and engage, we took them out into woods, into the woods and worked with 250 pupils from local schools, try, encouraging them to walk there where they could. Some of them had to come by bus from Sidmouth and Millwater couldn't come, so we took their workshops out to Millwater. And the idea was that for actually many of these local children, they hadn't spent any time in the woods, even though they were on their doorstep, was to encourage them to come in, explore and do new things in the woods. They, some of them who did know the woods know them from cycling and um, walking their dogs and maybe horse riding, but they hadn't kind of stopped to be present in them in a different way. So we did some mapping. We worked with, yeah, key point also is that we worked with Double Elephant Print Workshop as a cultural partner because they have experience of taking printmaking out. They've got strong experience of working with schools. And we know that, that printmaking is a, a really engaging way to, to, to deliver work creatively and to kind of have a very immediate high quality uh, art result. So we did some mindful um, mapping, some lying down, drawing silently, looking up, um, looking closely at things and li creating linear maps. We looked at historical maps of the woods and made scrolls for the children. So as they walked, they mapped what they saw and they heard. And these have now formed one of the, these are some of the results and formed one of the prompts in the boxes to encourage people to kind of map as they go, painting with the pigments on the ground, mud, or also just watercolours. And that's, you can see that's one of the prompts now that's been worked up and is in one of the boxes. Another um, aspect of the project was to create a literary sound walk. So to go beyond visual art and make something else that people could do, because this was all done during lockdown. So we're thinking, what can people do if they can't come here? And what can they do on their own? That isn't artists necessarily facilitator led. And this, we commissioned um, Ellen Wiles, a writer and creative write and creative writing lecturer at Exeter University to make a sound walk. So she, she met lots of the stakeholders of the East Devon Way and recorded, went in and recorded her own sound walk, walking along the East Devon Way through the woods. That was a response to the species there, the landscape, the history. And this can be downloaded um, and listen to from home or as you walk. And that also forms a prompt. So people can find this, just scan the like the, the sort of QR code and just listen to it. So some people have stumbled across this and some people have come to search for it. This was a lovely day during Heath Week where we collaborated with THG's Creative Cabin and Ellen led a family creative writing session and Double Elephant did drop-in printmaking. Um, and this was a chance for the school children, the 250 children to bring their families because it's really important that things don't just stay isolated at school, but they are encouraged to kind of come show what they've been doing and encourage the families to explore with them. Um, and then again, this is another collaboration with THG in October half term, where we printed using Ellen Soundwalk and some of the species she identified. We did um, four sessions of 10 participants and they printed work to take away. And that, so uh, this is the, um, yeah, so that was a way of encouraging families to come beyond schools. And this was a new departure and, uh, and quite an exciting project for the AOMB in that we're working with Active Devon, whose aim is to connect people actively. And we let's bring creative workshops into this and join, join up and see how this works. So this was a pilot project. 20 people over eight weeks so we could really monitor and evaluate the project. People were encouraged by or referred to the project by health and well-being um, health and well-being connectors like community builders and so they referred through Active Devon. They paid £24 over eight weeks so it was at an affordable accessible rate and they the idea was they would try lots of different art activities and 
explore how that, how it connect, how they felt it connected them to nature and how they felt from, uh, from the beginning of the, of the project to the end. So we did things like screen printing with found materials, dry point mark making. Here are some of the quotes I've included um, from their feedback. Um, photography. <laughs> Poetry. Interestingly, this was one that people reported as creating the, the, a really strong connection by being still and being challenged to write poetry, not in a traditional sense, but just in terms of just that uh, immediate feeling of writing what you feel, writing what you hear. And then we translated that into prints as when we got back to the, to the hall. Um, and then they were all given a sketchbook and journal to, to kind of keep a diary of how of the project and to share and to um, encourage them to continue. And the group have continued to meet. And in their finding, in our feedback, it was interesting that they all said it's encouraged them to create, try new creative processes. So as a result, we've been signposting the group and working with Active Dev and to um, signpost people to more free and accessible creative activities throughout East Devon. And we're looking at how to continue this because it was a really good way of walking and then doing something um, beyond walking that made you, that was creative really and encouraged people to try different things. This is the funding. So you can see that we've done, we managed to do quite a bit with a fairly modest um, budget. So we started with the DEFRA funding and got some arts council. And then we took, we took advantage of different COVID recovery grants as they came along throughout the year. So the, the project's still continuing for another three months. Um, with the places called Home Grant. And the benefit of joining up with the cultural partner is you can apply for different grants together, you can pool resources. And this is where we are now, what next? So I wrote this in, in November. So what I mean is like, what are we doing now in 2022? We are, we're continuing with the intergenerational map. Um, so we're working with Sidvale Memory Cafe and continuing to work with the primary schools to, to get, <laughs> make a map of Hartford Woods. Um, Hi, sorry, could I just interrupt a second? Um, yeah. Could everybody, uh, I think in this case it might be Brian, could we just mute our microphones when people are speaking because there's a lot of background noise. Thank you. Right, sorry, carry on. That's all right, oh, this is my last slide so I'll, I'll finish up now. Um, and we're looking at uh, my, developing the mindfulness aspect in partnership with Exeter University to create a mindfulness course. And also we, I've talked to Anna at THG about um, some nature focused creative hybrid courses. So things that would link to THG's programme and people could do online and also then come to the gallery or to some of these sites in East Devon, A, O and B. So that you have, because we're still currently working with people who are vulnerable and nervous of, of being out and mixing in, in small and sort of, in small spaces so we wanted to do things which enable people to participate from home but also where they chose to come and have some direct contact in the in the landscape and then working continuing to work with active devon and saving devon's treescapes so we'd like to look at long-term plans with them so this has been a very much a pilot project seeing what worked what didn't and how can we replicate this in other areas of east devon hartford's really convenient but you know, there are other spaces where we'd, and other communities we'd really like to work with. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I'm really happy to answer anything if that if there's anything that isn't clear, or if anyone would like to ask anything specifically. Um, first of all, can I just say thank you very much. That's really, really interesting. As somebody who will be going off to teach in a forest school after this, um, that was really interesting. And I might nick some of it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in terms of, I mean, the usual protocol is to have people inside and outside the forum um, speak in, in uh, that order. But I think just anybody who has a question um, or a point they'd like to make. Uh, Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Um, that was really interesting, Emma. And I just wanted to pick up on that issue of just scaling up the project, because I think you raised a number of issues that we've all been made aware of over the last couple of years for this, um, particularly the lockdowns with uh, renaissance in individuals, communities reconnecting with nature. It's been fascinating, you know, to see that. 
And I know you're focusing within the AOMB, and I just wonder what the opportunities are to sort of widen um, the scope of that to go outside of the AOMB. So it's not just unique, you know, to the, you know, to the um, nature reserves, green spaces that are within East Devon, just because I, I see this is very transferable across the whole of the district. I just wonder if there's an opportunity for collaboration. It's interesting, Tim, Tim's on the call, Tim Young's the Black Down Hills AOMB uh, uh, manager. And um, obviously I'm <clears throat> responsible for sites outside of um, the AOMB as well. I just wonder, just maybe a conversation offline, but just a, uh, an, an initial reaction to that. Because there's so much here that, you know, is, is really meaningful. I think it's a really good conversation for Devon when you think that Devon has got an extraordinary number of AOMBs and protected landscapes. Um, and yes, and, and I think the frustrating point is that you, you don't want to exclude particularly urban areas which, which are further and, and the communities are further away from the AOMBs and don't have easy access. And a problem with this project is Hartford Woods, you know, own, you can only walk there from two, from Newton Pop and Tipton and, and maybe Sidmouth if you're quite brave, but it's it's making it accessible for people, and that it, there are definitely barriers to for a lot of people who don't have access to, to their own cars, and um, there's very limited public transport. So yes, I think that it should expand. I mean, I'm I'm a freelancer that was that was brought into this through the AOMB, but there would be I don't know who the agencies would be to join this up, but then. I, you know, I could look into it, but there must be other people who would be able to deliver things beyond AOMB. I mean, the, the key people delivering nature connectedness, I don't know, University of Derby are, are at the forefront of it. Yeah, no, I agree. Chair, if I can just come back on that, I think, um, certainly from a public health perspective, I don't know what, you know, John thinks, um, but there's so many, you know, really... Um, obvious segues into um, the sort of f uh, physical and, and mental um, health um, agenda that we're looking to, um, you know, to sort of develop. And, you know, there's, there's, there's many things in the, the sorts of activities you're doing there that are very transferable across all ages. Um, and it's really worth sort of exploring. So um, I just wonder, I, I, you know, just looking at John, um, speaking on behalf of Helen, I wonder what he thinks. John? Thank you, Chair. Hi again, Emma. Um, yeah, fab, fabulous. Everybody should should get an opportunity to to have a taste of of this and the links, as you say, Chair, with with forest schools that are becoming quite a thing. Um, I think it's down to us to see if we can uh, upscale it, um, provide some sort of secure some funding. Emma's done extremely well to get to get funding clearly. Um, at, and as Charlie's indicating, I think, um, you know, we've got facilities where we can host this sort of activity and contacts with others that um, could do the same. So, yeah, I'll take it away and um, perhaps just give some thought and perhaps some offline conversations with, with Emma as to how we can uh, spread this wider, because it's such a wonderful opportunity for, for, for young and old. It's brilliant. I really like the presentation as well. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, John. Um, and thank you, everybody. Uh, Councillor Peter Faithful. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting you're saying about access. Um, some of us have been trying to push for a cycleway from um, Fenerton to Sidmouth. And even if we did the Sidma section, it would make a big difference to the access. Um, but this is really interesting stuff, what you're doing. Thanks. Um, yeah, just saying that if there's any way we can push to get that, at least the Sidma section, Sidma to Hartford Woods section of the cycleway, I think it would be appreciated. Okay, thank you to Councillor Faithful. That is noted. Um, I wish we had that power, but absolutely, um, that's definitely noted. Um, do we have anybody else wishing to speak? No, okay, so um, I would like to, yeah, thank you very, very much, Emma. That was really, really interesting. You're welcome to stick around and watch the rest um, of this marvellous meeting. Thank you very much on behalf of us all.
so now item seven the culture strategy works work scope uh, which is pages 35 to 39 on your uh, notes um, and a report will now be presented by the service lead countryside and leisure <laughs> mr charles plowden Thank you, Chair. Very eloquently done. Um, fortunately, this is rather more prosaic um, than uh, Emma's presentation, however, no less important. Um, so just briefly, if I can sort of recap, um, we've been having um, through the recent uh, budget and service plan uh, committee meetings. I think it's well understood now that this is an exciting time for culture. Uh, the new council plan um, for those um, eager beavers who are all over our corporate strategies will have noted that arts and culture uh, features large it's a key activity under our better homes and communities for all priority in the plan and this sits alongside a much stronger link to how arts culture and leisure can help to deliver multiple areas of the council's work program touched on public health but particularly tourism and climate change and we're going to hear a little bit um, from Catherine later on in the agenda all these um, themes are you know, really big priority areas for the council going forward. So this is where the development of the culture strategy will help to shape and articulate and provide a roadmap for our involvement with arts and culture over the next 10 years. So the brief for the 10 year strategy is to uh, design and ensure a much better engagement with multiple public community, statutory and non-statutory partners in the whole process. So very much sort of broadening out um, the, the scope of um, the existing strategy um, with its ambitions. I think we mustn't lose sight that uh, what we need to do is to recognise and to build on and also to consolidate the, the significant achievements that we've been delivering in the arts and culture domain, mainly through the THG, Manor Pavilion Theatre. It's good to see Graham here. Countryside team, our two A and B partnerships and also the really important grassroots villages in action program that we've been supporting for many years now. This will help to maximize um, uh, culture's contribution to East Devon's future well-being and sustainability. Also, the new kid on the block is the ACE network, uh, which is made up of a wide range of cultural practitioners and organizations and this forum which will be two of the primary consultative platforms for the appointed consultants to help shape the culture strategy. So uh, Ruth and I had a very long day yesterday evaluating the submissions for the culture strategy and we had a fantastic response and the quality was excellent. So we're looking to interview the shortlist on Tuesday and then look to make an appointment uh, on the 31st of January, so uh, the end of next week or early into next week, next week, all being well. So um, we have momentum going now with culture strategy, which I'm delighted to report. Uh, so just to recap, for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at the report in any detail, um, a few bullets just to uh, highlight about what strategy seeking to uh, the culture strategy seeking to deliver and what we're going to be asking the consultants to focus on. Firstly, that it uh, has to be a strategy that's fully inclusive. Um, so engaging with all our grassroots organizations in the consultation process. And that's been written into the brief. And that's something we'll be exploring more uh, when we interview the shortlisted consultants next week, because obviously there's a challenge with being a large rural district, how we really get that um, meaningful engagement, that sort of bottom up approach. Uh, secondly, uh, we desperately need a robust evidence base, um, a cultural evidence base for any future funding bids that we're looking to prepare, particularly around areas such as cultural regeneration and any community led um, bids that we want to put to the Arts Council or the Lottery and increasingly a discussion um, that Ruth usually usefully um, mentioned yesterday, that funds such as the levelling up funds, um, you know, become increasingly more important um, in the sort of post Brexit world you know, where there are significant uh, funds available to, to look at how culture, economic development, the sort of cultural regeneration can come in. And we've already started a, um, a conversation on that uh, within Exmouth with the um, cultural quarter there. So uh, we'll need the strategy to, to provide that, that evidence base for any funds going forward. Um, thirdly, uh, critically, the strategy, the culture strategy needs to synergize with our emerging tourism strategy, 
um, to ensure that the two areas can develop programs such as cultural tourism that can help our local economy, especially our rural areas. And I know that um, the economic development team, Jerry, who's leading this process, is running in a pretty similar time frame to us with the culture strategy. So it's a real opportunity to make sure that um, we don't miss that trick to bring those together. And I know um, our portfolio holder, uh, Councillor Nick Cookway, is very keen to see that um, develop as well. And those will be the sorts of conversations we'll be having within this forum and also, you know, the uh, other wider uh, uh, consultation forums that uh, are within the council. Uh, and penultimately, uh, we need, and this is something that we've been lacking for a long time, certainly in my time, I mean, the role as a comprehensive database of organisation, organisations, excuse me, um, engaging in the arts and culture se uh, sector in East Devon, um, that will help our understanding of what's being delivered across the district. So that gives us a very easy toolkit to be able to target our future activities going forward. And finally, Chair, um, to ask the consultants to give us a delivery plan that's linked to the strategy. So it's not all just words, I'm um, in theory. Um, we need a delivery plan that's, that is actually grounded in reality, that it's achievable in its targets, both in a, attracting funds and developing the sort of cross-sector partnerships that will help us uh, to shoulder the ambitions that are within the, uh, the culture strategy. I think it's patently obvious from those of us who've been engaged in recent budgetary discussions that we can't do this alone. We're gonna need to build the sort of partnerships um, you know, with statutory, non-statutory organizations, community groups that can help us take this strategy, for, strategy forward. But we are a key player to make that happen, a sort of enabler or a broker, as well as a sort of delivery side of um, the strategy. So I think, I hope from the consultations that the uh, consultant will take forward, we'll be able to start to sort of build that sense of um, cross district um, purpose to how we can move some of these projects forward. Because I think if um, anyone's expecting the district council to uh, fund and underpin every single project that comes out of that, that's just not gonna happen. So there's a lot of work ahead, hence that's why it's a 10 year strategy. We need to build to that stage. We need to get that sort of level of understanding, that confidence to be able to take it forward. Um, so it's a really big document. I don't want to uh, underplay that. I know we've got considerable challenges uh, in terms of our budgetary um, situation going forward, but I'm confident that um, what come out of the strategy and the delivery plan, with it hitting the themes around tourism, public health, uh, the natural environment, you know, we can really make some big inroads here. And that's it from me. Thanks, Chair. Happy to take any questions. And Ruth as well. Um, the two of us have been working on this. Um, that's really, really brilliant, uh, Charlie. I think um, it's good that you highlighted the financial challenges because they are, you know, becoming more acute. But if this is in place, then we'll be in a position to, to find that money from elsewhere as much as we'd like to, you know, to fund it all through the council. I think it's um, it's vital and it's it's timely that it's happening when it is. It really, really is. So as with the previous item, I'm happy to take questions from anybody on the committee or outside of the committee. Um, Councillor Bruce Estarra. Morning, Bruce. Morning, morning, Councillor Joe. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. That was a, that was a really good uh, introduction to the piece. And I note that you're looking at a, a 10 year, a 10 year strategy. Um, and you mentioned the Thelma Hewitt Gallery at the beginning of, 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 the, of the document. Um, what role would you see that large towns like Exmouth could um, do for this so that Exmouth can uh, benefit uh, from this strategy uh, in, within the 10 year time frame you, you talk about? Um, as clearly you mentioned the Exmouth Cultural Quarter, and I know there's the Wild Exmouth and various other projects, um, but I wonder how you're going to sort of get the consultants to advertise this so that the large towns like Exmouth uh, and others will, will benefit from it. Uh, thanks, Charlie. If I can respond there, Chair, um, Bruce, uh, simply critical that our towns are involved and I would expect the consultants to be working. Part of their um, programme of consultation um, will be to ensure that we are talking to all our, um, all our towns um, because there is so much cultural activity that's going on within all of our towns across the district. So it's not just exclusively about the rural areas it's understanding the relationship between our towns and the rural areas. That's the critical thing. And it will be a different sort of consultation, I think, for rural areas because they don't have um, 
perhaps the the capacity or or um, the sort of support there to actually um, help bring forward initiatives and projects. But as you quite rightly say, uh, in Exmouth, is a really thriving arts and cultural community there that's leading actually a lot of um, of community led work and. I would hope that the consultants can, can capture that and then we can look to, to build on that because it comes back to what I was saying, Bruce, that we can't do this alone as a district council. I genuinely believe the partnership has to be at all levels, you know, at the grassroots local level through to the sort of the national. And we've got to get the narrative right within the strategy to make sure that that is well understood, um, you know, particularly for those sort of funding bodies that we're going to be uh, approaching. So absolutely in that timescale within the consultation, um, all our communities, uh, all our towns will be involved in that process with a gathering of uh, understanding and knowledge, what the ambitions are within the town. Um, this is obviously preempting what the consultants, that's what I think Ruth and I would like to see happen because if we don't have that evidence base, it's gonna be really hard. We've missed a trick in terms of gathering it. That's what I, you know, I said in one of the bullets that we, we need to gather that information to be able to sort of have that almost map of you know, what's going on across the district. Thanks, Charlie, that's re really helpful. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. And uh, thank you, Bruce, for your question. Uh, Councillor Vicky Johns. Thank you, Chair. Um, so when your consultants, et cetera, are looking across East Devon, I'm assuming that they're looking at all um, art groups, et cetera, across East Devon, um, all arts and culture, et cetera. I, will, I know I'm not on the committee, but I will declare an interest because I am actually the art administrator for Southwest Academy of Fine and Applied Arts, and we will be having a base very shortly in East Devon. Um, so will you be approaching all of those kinds of groups as well? Um, and seeing exactly what they're doing, because, you know, a lot of those types of groups, not just the one that I work for, there's various others as well, also do things very similar. Um, in fact, we have worked alongside Thelma Hubert for a number of years as well. Um, so will you be looking at, uh, across all of those as well to see, because obviously they bring in travel and tourism. We had an open exhibition back in October of last year, and I know that there's lots of other various groups that do similar things, which will obviously then highlight the tourism, etc., in our area. And... A lot of the groups try to do them, for want of a better phrase, out of season, et cetera, to try and encourage people to come to what is basically seen as a summer you know, destination, try to encourage them to come at other times of year as well. So is that the sort of thing that you will be looking to work towards as well, Charlie, if I may ask? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no worries, Vicky. And good showboat on um, the, uh, the fine art um, link. Nice one. Um, yeah, yeah. I wonder if Ruth might be able to come back on that as well. My view is yes, absolutely. And I think the challenge sort of really particularly the rural areas about how we can get a, um, an approach the consultants can develop a really innovative approach and that's probably going to be one of the areas that we're going to be um, quizzing uh, uh, the shortlist of consultants um, next week more about how how they can bring those groups together to be able to cover exactly what you're saying Vicky or, you know a very diverse sort of group because as you, you can probably appreciate um, we've got, we set aside four months. It's a limited amount of money. We've got to really target this very carefully. So if it's a scattergun approach, it's going to be really hard to pull that together. And this is why obviously we're relying on the right consultant, you know, who's really good at this, making sure the consultations are really targeted and how we do that, particularly in the rural areas. Um, the, the towns I'm not so worried about is the rural areas that we do that and we capture everybody, but there will be a shout out to individuals like yourself, Vicky, to say, right, before that, who do we need to be getting in touch with uh, to be part of that consultation? So that's where the engagement process comes, which is a kind of stands a bit like the leisure strategy that's going on at the moment with all getting the sports clubs and schools involved. There's been quite a lot of information flow between ourselves, the county, et cetera, LED, to get all those sort of names and organisations for I see a similar kind of exercise for the culture strategy. Um, so the consultants can then design the workshops around it and the consultations. I don't know if Ruth wants to say uh, any more on that. You're on mute. Sorry, excuse me. Yes, um, SWAC will be absolutely pivotal to the consultation process, as will every established art group, such as Exmouth Art Group or Sidmouth or Budley. So that will be the first go-to. And then we're hoping that you'll, you'll help the consultants reach those other 
maybe perhaps hard to find creative so that we've got a really good sense of the cultural ecology of, of East Devon. Um, I'll come on to in my presentation about the first opportunity to meet the appointed consultants next month. As Charlie says, we'll be working at speed. So your database and your existing network will be really, really important to informing the consultants' research. If Thank I can much. just come back on that briefly, yeah, Joe, if I may. Yeah, um, the, the, only, the only thing that I would say is that the one thing that I've noticed with being an art administrator as opposed to an administrator in any other business that I've ever worked in is that the arts work together, which is really unusual because normally as an administrator, business is very much like to very cloak and dagger and keep everything to themselves. Whereas arts, regardless of what art it is, are happy to work with each other. They're happy to collaborate. And in fact, they encourage each other, um, which makes a massive difference when going out to consultation. You don't have that well, I can't tell you this in case the other group finds out, they're very much happy to work with each other. I mean, we work with Thelma Huber on numerous occasions over the last few years um, and various other organisations. Um, and I know that all of the other ones do as well. So it is something that as a consultant, when they come in, at least they're not going to have to try and, you know, root around and dig things out because people do quite happily go, oh yeah, well, you need to go and speak to such and such because they're really good at doing this and, and, and that. So that's, that's really good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And that's a very, very good point. Um, Councillor, oh, hello, Councillor Miller. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chair, and apologies that I was late. Um, I'm presuming we're on the uh, item, because I don't want to get it wrong, uh, on the culture strategy. Absolutely right. And I wanted to make a comment about that. Um, a few Please comments. Do. Thank you. So obviously, I really welcome this report and all the, all the work that's, that's going to go into this. I've read the document and the aim of the cultural strategy, and there are four really good bullet points on the purpose behind the culture strategy. But I would actually like to suggest a fifth one, if you don't mind, Chair, because um, obviously I think this is going to be a really important strategy for us. And I think there's a there's an extra thing that I think needs to be added, which is to harness the talents and aspirations of people who live in the district. And what I mean by that is um, I think, Chair, both of us have, have, have seen in, in our town of Exmouth that there's a real lack of um, infrastructure, if you would call it that, facilities, free, free space for, um, for local residents, uh, young people, um, so, I mean, to, to, to express themselves in, in the sense of, you know, free music practice space, free, play, free space for them to practice performance of, of, of all kinds. And I think we need to provide that space for, for people within our communities. And over the last uh, 10, 20 years, we've seen through government cuts, you know, a reduction in these kind of air spaces, such as um, youth clubs, for example. But I, I just think that this kind of thing needs to be um, a real, uh, at the heart of our cultural strategy, actually, that we're providing opportunities for people who live here to, to be able to, to be able to get involved and, and be part of a community or a, a culture community and of course to, 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 to encourage that kind of collaboration. It might be that we look towards other authorities to see how that kind of thing is funded but I definitely think that we, I mean I was just, I, the reason I'm late to this meeting, I just had a meeting with Peter Gilpin, he's obviously the CEO of LED, but there are spaces that we already have within the district, such as ocean and other areas that I believe can be adapted to be used to provide this kind of, these kind of facilities for people. So, as I say, as well as the four excellent bullet points, which I think are absolutely key to creating an effective cultural strategy, I think we've got to remember that what another key plank of that should be should be about um, growing our own and providing opportunities for our own residents, uh, especially young people, in my view. Um, so thanks very much, Chair, for, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Councillor Miller. When you speak about this, you're talking about the uh, aims of, uh, so in the report, you're talking about the bit where it's, uh, it says aims of the cultural strategy and there's four, four bullet points after that. Um, yeah. 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 OK, Charlie, what do, what do you think um, on that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, the way I see it is that you, sorry, I said, what do you think? And then I, yeah. um, God, me. What, the way I see it is that, is that what Councillor Miller has said is vital, but that's something that will come as a result of this rather than 
um, and and you going forward can take that to the to to the process. And when you're appointing, you know, appointing them, make sure that that's something that's that's included. What do you think, Charlie? I will let you speak now. Are you sure? Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, you took the words out of my mouth in that I was going to say to, to Paul on that, that when we had the consultation, there'd be an opportunity to, to raise that. Because interestingly, I think it was part of um, Andy Wood's levelling up bid, which was looking at creating the sort of um, spaces you were talking about, Paul. I've got, there was a there was a sort of catchy word they used for it, some sort of, creative box or it was a kind of pop-up sort of facility for um a sort of creative artist space which unfortunately got um taken out when um, the bid was submitted it became much more about um improving um highway infrastructure but that's still there so that comes back to the point i was making about how we engage with um the sort of particular sort of leveling up funds i keep coming back to that and there's another sort of strand of sort of funding areas that can create that sort of infrastructure because so i think you're absolutely right that will come up in the consultations i can guarantee it that there are not enough spaces to be able to sort of develop um or, or to provide you know as you say um yeah a whole range of the creative arts sector to, to you know to use you know it's free space for practice for performances etc um and we inquiry so we need to look at our own assets as well um if they're being underutilized, I, I think that's a really important part of, um, you know, what the culture strategy will do. We'll look at that. So, yes, I think it's an opportunity to build that in. Um, and there are funds out there to build into, you know, future bids. That's why a 10 year strategy is a really good time frame, because, you know, how difficult it can be to sort of get landowners, you know, all the kind of permissions in place, et cetera, you know, to create these sorts of facilities. So, um so I'll be confident, you know, that we can do that. So hopefully that will come out, you know, from um, from the consultation. So yes, noted. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Miller. And it's something that I um, certainly, if when consulted, it's certainly something that I will be um, pushing for because, as you know, what you've talked about is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, is that okay, Councillor Miller? Yes, thanks, thanks, Chair. Cheers. Excellent work. Right, uh, Councillor Buchan. Hello there. Um, hi, Joe. I represent Cranbrook, which is a very new young town. We don't have Exmouth's rich uh, sort of cult cultural history and things, and uh, there's a bit of a cultural desert where we are. So I'm just wondering from this plan how there's no there's nobody for the consultants to actually probably consult with or engage with on our experts. How are we going to benefit from this plan? Charlie, Ruth, that's a really good question. Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, it, it's interesting because I, there is a um, there's a culture strategy or culture plan. I think if I'm right, Colin, for Cranbrook that consultants did. I think it was Ginkgo consultants about five or six years ago. Um, that um, was led. I can't remember. It was an internal document. It'd be really useful. I, I don't know how um, relevant that document is now I think it's about four or five years ago to bring that out and we will be useful for our consultants to, to, to look at that and I don't know whether the town council looked at that and been able to use that to help to identify where sort of the priorities are in terms of infrastructure programs activities etc for the sort of wider sort of arts and culture program so it's a bit of a threat sort of question back to Colin really on that um, if I can chair yeah, please, Colin. Well, I, I wasn't around then. No, are we interested? <laughs> could, you, could you flag up that document for me so I can dig it out and have a look at that? Yeah, I, what I'll do is I will, I think Ken G. Sherman, I think the our urban designer led the consultation. It was through the um, um, new community projects team that it was commissioned. Um, so I, I will offline, I will get that document, you know, to you and um I, you know i could get alethea to um to circulate it um as part of the the minutes if, if it's um required but i know that was a it was a really useful document that was trying to as you say um identify where the town could start to sort of develop its culture program so um rather than reinventing the wheel i think the consultants would be useful to look at that and then when discussing with cranbrook so where we're at 
Um, otherwise, we'll be just going over the same old ground. Appreciate that, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Furthermore, THG will be working in Cranbrook this summer, so um, you definitely won't be forgotten. Excellent. Cheers, Ruth. Um, okay, so and thank you very much, uh, Councillor Buchan. And now, Councillor Peter Faithful. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, referring to Cranbrook, um, there is actually quite a bit of history in and around the vicinity. And there is a listed building which is in a pretty poor state, which really needs protecting. I think uh, Cranbrook really if they want to I have a heritage, they need to look very carefully at what they've, what they've been built on and the history of the area, because there is quite a bit of history there. If they bother to look, they need to get into the Devon Records office and check out what there is around there. And if they make that as their basis, otherwise there's a real danger, the way it's been going on, it's just been obliterating what history there is. There is actually a history there. You just need to get, get really dig urgently and protect what you have before it disappears completely. Thank you very much, Councillor Faithful. Um, and that is that is definitely noted. Um, okay, so we have no more questions. Um, and unusually for this forum, we do have a recommendation. Um, Okay, which we need to vote on. And the recommendation is that Cabinet be recommended to approve the scope of work for producing the culture strategy evidence base as detailed in the report. Um, so members of the committee, if we could now vote using green ticks and red crosses and electronic hands for abstention. Okay, Chair, so we've got six uh, green ticks, no crosses and no abstentions. So that's the recommendation carried. Absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, so agenda item eight from the Thel uh, sorry, Thelma Huber Gallery uh, programme, uh, which is pages 40 to 54 in the reports pack. And we will now receive a presentation from Arts Development Manager, THG Curator, Ruth Gooding. Good morning, Ruth, again. Hi, Joe, thank you. That's great, Thank Ruth. you for this opportunity. Uh, um, it's great to be able to reflect, as, as we were saying, can't believe it's been a year that has passed. So I'm going to be trying to be as succinct as I can because a lot of, has happened um, in 2021 and we've got a lot of exciting plans for, for 2022. I can't quite believe I'm talking about 2022 already. Um, but we were, we were really proud of what we did achieve in 2021. And though the gallery didn't open till June, when all galleries were allowed to open, um, we did achieve so much and we were determined to support our communities and quickly and imaginatively redesign elements of our programme, developing touring and online projects, new commissions and creative resources. We expanded our impact across East Devon, rooting creativity and community in place and establishing a sub-regional strategic role for culture. To enable us to reach audiences, we established four new delivery mechanisms the Creative Cabin, the Ocean Gallery, Digital Shorts, and Arts and Culture East Devon Network. The 2021 programme included exhibitions, Mike Perry, Lansley at Ocean, Exmouth and THG, and in plain sight, the London group, Thelma Holbert and her London group friends, which were enjoyed by over 3,000 visitors. Our engagement programme was driven by our award-winning Creative Cabin, a repurposed display trailer which took art and nature activities on tour, directly engaging communities during the pandemic. 
The tour included 30 different rural villages, towns, schools and colleges. To date, we have had direct engagement with 2,820 adults and 4,806 young people. The project highlighted our expertise in gallery education, which is recognised with the Marsh Award for our Learning Officer and our OVC. The success of the Creative Cabin led on to the next steps in our pandemic and ecological emergency response climate conversations. Climate conversations. This is a multi-site public program, marketing campaign and touring project developed within the context of East Devon District Council's commitment to Devon Climate Change Emergency Declaration. We opened Mike Perry Land Sea at Ocean in June uh, once the restrictions were lifted and we matched footfall at THG and Ocean so it was definitely a worthwhile exercise where we could socially distance more people in uh, the facility in, in Exmouth. During the most challenging moments of the pandemic we took our learning and engagement program online, our short program grew and sustained connectivity with our audience, it enabled us to support artists based all over the UK to make new work, discuss ideas and develop editing skills while inspiring audiences with a range of creative content from herbalism to art history, world swimming to pottery. And we now run regular art history talks in the THG gallery every winter. Following sector research and public consultation, in February 2021, we established AIST, Arts and Culture East Devon, a public network for artists, cultural services, organisations, and those working with local social wellbeing and inclusion economic development agendas to engage, network and promote arts and culture. It operates as a central platform to support innovation in rural culture production through partnership and collaboration. The network is now 400 plus strong and is formally linked to the constituted ACE forum chaired by elected members. This enables information to flow in both directions, a process supported by appointed champions who attend both the network and the forum meetings. As such, the network will democratise and diversify opportunities for creative participation while empowering a wide range of voices to shape engagements with economic wellbeing and tourism agendas. The timing of this is vital as E7 District Council is now in the process of commissioning a new cultural plan as we discussed. We interviewed Plymouth Culture, Exeter Culture and Tall Bay Culture and this revealed that the imperative of a consultative mechanism to shape the development of the cultural plan and its implementation. The ACE network will drive cultural development in East Devon and ensure that cultural planning considers inclusivity, relevance, environmental responsibility in line with Arts Council England's Let's Create 10 year strategy. We have forged resilient partnerships across East Devon with East Devon District Council services, grown and strengthened disciplinary partnerships, which included Wild East Devon, AOMB East, uh, East Devon, and AOMB Blackdown Hills. Devon Recovery Learning Partnership, NHS, um, Leisure East Devon, and Arts and Culture, the University of Exeter, which has been a pivotal partner. As Charlie said, we're delighted to see that culture uh, is now uh, priority one in the council plan. Um, and this year, the next phase of our work, we are working on a project called Towards a New Model for Inclusive Rural Culture Production. We will help stabilize East Devon's art ecology as a whole, linking culture and creativity into wider agendas such as the climate emergency, inequality, rurality and post-pandemic uh, recovery. So the programme Creative Communities and the Land explores inequality and environmental justice while celebrating individual creative expression. Sadly, uh, we didn't have a private view to start the year, which we would normally do because of the pandemic, but we were delighted to open two shows last Saturday at THG and Ocean by Mikael Karakis. So at THG, we have Children of Unquiet. This work was created with a group of 45 children living in Devils Valley in Tuscany, a volcanic landscape and home to the world's first geothermal power station. And at Ocean, we have an immersive seascape called Sea Women, which follows a group of uh, women called the Haino, which is a Korean for sea women, now in the late 70s and 80s, who dive to great depths with no oxygen supply to find pearls and catch seafood. I hope you can join us to meet the artist who really is quite inspirational on the 11th of February at one of our next Climate Conversations public events. Uh, this exhibition is followed by a new exhibition, um, a new body of work by Nick Gloss, which is curated by Melissa Blanchflower from the Serpentine. Um, then in the summer, we present a solo exhibition by Inga Pollard, 
in collaboration with Devon and Exeter institutions, uh, institution Libraries Unlimited and the University of Exeter. And finally, we have our special blockbuster selling exhibition, uh, Present Maker. Our learning exhibition includes regular sessions with under fives, um, our youth art class masterpieces and our art history talks. Um, this year, I'm excited to share the news that the Creative Cabin and our outreach programme is going to be focused on the Cliff Valley, working with our new partner, Roots for Roots. So we'll be looking at Pinhoe, Cranbrook and Broadcliff, whilst also supporting our existing audiences. Um, so, so that's the THG audience development plan. Um, there are three themes there. We're engaging our core audience of lapsed during the pandemic. This is still a challenge as audience confidence grows um, or recovers, increase the diversity of our audience and building the audience for contemporary art. So with the current show, for example, with Mikhail Karakas, that is a loan of artwork from the Arts Council collection and working with partners like the Arts Council collection, we have learned from our experience of working with Tate Artists Rooms is really pivotal in broadening our reach um, into those urban audiences, Bristol, Exeter, up to London, as we continue to support our local communities as well. Um, so I'm sorry to say that one of our speakers on the agenda today, um, are one of our brilliant champions, Anna Fitzgerald, is not able to join us. Um, so in lieu of Anna, um, I just thought I'd share the details of the current brilliant champions that we have. John Astley, who's our education champion, and also is always looking for articles for the Exmouth Journal, and um, is a brilliant advocate of uh, learning and engagement. Alex Gerald, who's the artist in residence at Powderham, um, a painter um, and community artist, absolutely brilliant and engaging uh, with young people and communities. Ella Esnoff, who's actually the curator of our Inga Pollard exhibition in the summer, um, is supporting institutions that affect decolonisation and Gemma Durbin, who is our uh, resident craft expert. You'll be able to meet the champions at our next in-person forum, which is on the 7th of February in THG. We're gonna have a breakfast forum, and it will also be an opportunity to see the exhibition, the new film work at THG. So I hope to see you there. Fingers crossed, if Charlie and I pull it off, we might have the, the new uh, cultural uh, strategic consultant there as well, but we'll see. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very, very much, Ruth. Um, yeah, so uh, does anybody have any questions for Ruth on what it looks to be a really exciting year ahead? I guess that means you've answered everything. You've, you've, you've left them no room for doubt. Everything that they, oh, okay. Charlie, there's always one, isn't there? No, no, I was just going to, well, yeah. So great presentation, Ruth, as always. Um, really exciting and yeah, just encourage everybody to, as Ruth said, to come along and enjoy um, you know, the exhibitions that are there. And, and just that also reiterates our last point about you know, the audience development, not just with the gallery, but I know Graham's been on this call, you know, theatre manager, the Manor Pavilion Theatre, also the Exmouth Pavilion. You know, all our theatres, you know, have had such a tough time the last two years. Absolutely critical that we look to get them back to um, you know, where they were pre-pandemic over the next sort of 12 months to sort of rebuild that confidence. I can't say how important that is. Um, as Ruth knows in, you know, her work um, and also with the theatres, they support so many local economy, you know, our freelancers, be they lighting crews, um, production sets, uh, designers, um, sound engineers, you know, probably people you may know, you know, within your local community who are working in, you know, this particular industry. So it's absolutely vital those centres, you know, are up and running and thriving again. And um, I'd like to think, you know, that um, particularly corporately with our uh, comms team, we can really look to push that. It's a big theme for this year about the big bounce back, you know, for our, you know, our cultural venues, um, because, yeah, as things are changing very quickly now with the advice that's coming from government, you know, we really need to sort of get a wriggle on and make sure, you know, that people are aware. And they have the confidence to come back into the venues because they are uh, regularly checked uh, with our health and safety uh, team to make sure we're still complying. So there's a reassurance there for anyone who's ner um, nervous. So a bit of a plug, sorry, Chair, but I think that's a theme, you know, that we need to get behind uh, and really look to, you know, to push this year, the sort of the cultural bounce back, you know, within East Devon, not just with our venues, but all venues across East Devon. 
Definitely. Um, and I think, you know, it comes back to a conversation that I know we've had many times, uh, what is culture? And in terms of re-engaging those, those venues and things like that, I think it's, um, you know, we've, we've spoken about it being a fine art exhibition to a tribute band, to, you know, a man in a pub playing the spoons. It's all culture and it's all stuff which encourages economic activity and a massive bounce back. Um, could I just apologise if you hear the noise of screeching children in the background? I am in a room in a school. Uh, where I work. So apologies for that if it gets in the way. They're lovely, really. Um, Councillor Moulding. Yes, thank you, Chair. And congratulations to Ruth on all the excellent work that Thelma Holbert is, is doing, particularly reaching out right across East Devon with all sorts of brilliant initiatives. Um, I was very much involved in the acquisition of the Thelma Holbert Gallery back in the late 80s, early 90s, I guess it was. And, um, and it's so gratifying to see the way, way that it is. Uh, it has progressed since then. And, and I think that was what we very much hoped that it would be, be a centre of attraction for, for art in East Devon right across the board. Um, just a, a little pedantic thing, really, from me. Um, Thelma Holbert was a, a very progressive uh, artist back in her day. And this house was where she was um, uh, living and carried out a lot of her work. And the pedantic element of it is that she is Thelma Holbert. And so often I hear people calling it the Thelma Hubert Gallery. And it just bugs me a little bit. That's OK. Thank you. As the modding, you have my utmost apologies. I will do. <laughs> but it's Hulbert. Hulbert. Not Hulbert. Right, okay. I will. I will. Right. I stand corrected. Thank you. Um, uh, John Golding. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Ruth. Uh, as always, a, a really good update report and some great graphics there. Uh, I just wanted to say that that concept of um, the gallery being a cultural hub, but the work that you've done over the last few years in terms of taking out the, the essence of the gallery into the community and then joining up with, with other agendas like the climate change agenda, for example. For me, that's really important. And I think that's enhanced the reputation of the gallery it's moved it outside of Honiton um, so that other communities can enjoy some of the stuff that you, you put on in, in the gallery. I'd like to see that expanded to even uh, more communities and really encourage you and the team to, to carry on that journey because I, I just feel it's so important. We've got a great core offer in terms of the gallery, um, but increasingly you've you've taken it out to communities and I think really enhanced the reputation of, of what we've got there and exposed that to people that perhaps hadn't called into the gallery ever before and now encouraging them to do so. So for me, please carry on that, that journey. I think it's brilliant um, what you've achieved over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I can only echo that, obviously. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's been, given the circumstances, I, I think, you know, the, the, the way that, um, the, the, that you, the, the whole thing has developed and then you forge on again, you know, when, there's, when there was a lockdown, you look to bring it outside to other people. It's just it's the, the adaptability and the, um, the, the way that you've not let anything get in the way, I think, has been marvellous. Um, Thank you. Joe, may I just say on, on, yes, on of this course. point that it, the team and I are really grateful as well for the, the support that we've had from um, SMT and, and councillors to be as dynamic as we've been able to be. Um, there's been so much belief in, in the value of us and how we can support communities through this challenging time. And it's really given us drive um, and renewed energy and commitment. And so thank you so much. Brilliant. You're welcome. Um, do we have any more questions for Ruth? 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, right, so the next item would be agenda item nine, the uh, ACE members network update, but I think we've kind of covered that previously, haven't we? Because Anna isn't here to talk about it. Um, so um, for the, so attend the, uh, the meeting in February, I think for, for a more full update. Is that fair? Would you say Ruth? Yes, exactly. And, you, and meet Anna and the rest of the champions, then please do join us. Brilliant. OK, so we will move on to agenda item 10. Can I just ask you a quick question? Is that meeting open to all councillors or just members of the forum? It's open to everyone in the every public. It's, um, it's a public forum, network, a, a network um, meeting. Thank you. Sorry. That's no problem at all, uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you. Um, so, agenda item 10, net zero by 2040, which is page 55 to 68 in the notes. Um, we will now receive a presentation from the Climate Change Officer. A uh, warm welcome to Catherine Causley. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this. Right, bear with me. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, 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 oh, I've got too much stuff up. Here I am. Um, so, I need to make a big, oh, I've got a silly thing in the way. Bear with me for now. Um, okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Catherine Causley. I'm the newly appointed climate change officer. Um, uh, I've been in post now for just over six months. Um, uh, some of you I know, some of you I've, I've met, and uh, uh, some people are, are new to me. So I wanted to look at the kind of the big picture. So our aim is to get to net zero by 2040. And also wanted to explore the role that art has to play in this. I must admit that art is something that's not really been a massive part of my life, of my childhood. It's something that kind of, um, uh, it, it wasn't in our orbit as a family. Um, as I've grown older and I've been involved in environmental activism and, and community work, I've seen the power that art can have. And I'm so impressed by the work that um, the THG, THG Gallery have done about the, the work of the Creative Cabin. Um, and just that the focus that East Devon District Council has on this and the importance that we've put, um, I think that art is a really good way of engaging people. Right. So art can help us discuss some of the really big issues. Um, it can help us, you know, look at some of the challenges. Art can be brave and maybe brave in a way that sometimes we're not able to be. Art can be shocking and it, it can really make you think. And art can say the things that we perhaps can't. So this is the big picture. This is where we're at, at the moment. About 42% of Devon's carbon emissions come from uh, buildings. So um, housing and domestic, um, housing and commercial, and it's about a 50-50 split. Transport accounts for about 30%. Industrial processes, um, land use and, and waste makes up the rest. There are some massive and very scary numbers involved with, with climate change. You know, we have 4,200 tenanted properties and to get them all to an EPC score of, of a, approximately C, we don't really know the figures, but back of our fag pack, it would suggest it'd be somewhere around £190 million. We know 60% of car journeys are less than six miles. So doing things to target this, some of these aspects are so important. I personally don't think electric vehicles are the answer. We need to really revolutionise the way that, that we travel. And we know that 75% of the flights are taken by 15% of the population. We have the lowest tree cover out of the G7 countries at only 13%. And our East Devon wide carbon footprint is, is just uh, about a million tonnes of CO2. Um, and our East Devon one is about 29,000 tonnes there's some variability, COVID has skewed our figures slightly. The Committee for Climate Change 
has suggested that 60% of the reductions that we need to make will need to come from behaviour change. But that's really hard. Getting people to change their behaviour is almost impossible. Um, we need the push and the pull from up, down uh, and sideways. And, you know, we all hate plastic waste, don't we? There's so much misinformation about figures and, uh, uh, and greenwashing and, and maybe a, a lack of focus on some of the, the key figures. You know, how many people here have given up plastic straws because of, you know, the fish in the sea? Well, actually, 48% of plastic waste comes from fishing. If you don't want plastic in the sea, stop eating fish. This is the harder message to take. We as a, a country get through 300,000 tonnes of clothing a year. You know, this is where the behaviour change aspect comes in. We need to stop thinking of clothing as something that is basically disposable. Some of these things, they're on such a massive scale that it's really hard to picture. So this is, this is just some flights all coming in and out of a certain area at a certain time. When we, you know, I, as an environmentalist, I've, I've been really involved in community work and all sorts of things and even I struggle to comprehend the scale and the speed at which we are going to need to change in order to start to meet our um, our commitments and there is an absolute unpalatable truth to all this the government at the moment we are focusing down the bottom here you know the advice we're given is to you know wash your clothes with, with with colder water don't use tumble dryers you know recycle upgrade your light bulbs turn your heating down one degree they're all great but they are going to have a very small impact you know the hard stuff the hard stuff is you know maybe don't fly maybe eat a plant-based diet or at least massively reduce your meat consumption maybe you know green energy installing renewable energy and these are the things maybe live car free these are the things that we're going to have to do if we're going to make the big, achieve, the big um, reductions. A normal, a typical family in East Devon will probably have a carbon footprint of about 10 tonnes. Me and my family over years have worked really hard and we've reduced our footprint to 6.5%. And we've done all the easy-ish stuff that we can do without, you know, living in a cave and foraging for berries so you know we have green energy i have solar panels we only have one car we cycle we reduced our meat and dairy consumption and still and still so much of it is outside of my control and this is where we need the the um we need the will the political will and uh, from from above as well as blue so devon climate emergency they've been doing amazing work and their devon um carbon plan should be ready in 2023 so we've gone through all these beginning stages we've done the call of, for evidence we've done the youth parliament and we've done all the thematic hearings we've had drafts they've been um they've been publicly consulted and we did the online they did the online citizens assembly and the point we're at now is that the interim devon carbon plan is having um the actions developed as a response that sorry on the back of the online citizens assembly and hopefully this summer the report is going to come out for public consultation so um it was about 1500 people that consulted on the interim report we're hoping that's going to be a bigger number um this time around it tends to build with 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 each um uh, each time it goes out and we're hoping that the full plan will be ready um in 2023 so i spoke to doug eltham they're doing amazing work and they're, and they're really taking an excellent approach to this and as he said um this type of work takes a long time in a democracy but getting everyone on board and uh, agreeing the principles is so important we have our own climate change action plan strategy and it's fantastic it it's got over 100, 100 uh, actions and themes and involves every department and actually if we can if we could make serious headway into that we'll have done a really good job but it covers a whole you know it looks at everything our energy supply and com consumption water supply transport purchasing and that's the thing climate change is going to affect every part of our lives and also it's in involved in every part of our um, council actions So what have we actually done so far? Now this slide, I could actually make about three of these slides. I, I decided not to do put everything on because otherwise we'd be here all day. But actually as a council, we're really working hard. Lots of our departments have done lots of things. Every time I speak to someone, someone will say, oh, and did you know about, you know, so I'm always finding out more. 
but we've done we've we've installed air source heat pumps on a whole number of our properties we're putting in um, ev charging points for cars our street scene we're about 25 percent um, electrified at the moment we've done carbon literacy training with a whole series of our councillors and um and senior management team and people within key roles we're working our stock condition survey cliss valley lower auto lower auto restoration project plus you know you look at all the brilliant stuff that we're doing um with with we've done some films um our climate conversations team they're out all the time i've recently got some funding we're going to have more bike parking we're going to start embedding training and uh, uh the knowledge around climate change at the heart of what we do we've got water fountains co-cars and we're maybe looking at a climate ambassadors program which is going to involve children This quote was on the back of uh, that came off the back of the citizens assembly, um, and it and it, so bear in mind that the citizens assembly. Some people criticised it for not being um, out there enough, for not being radical enough, for um, and actually the 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 public. So it was a representative sample of of the the profile of Devon residents. Um, were given like twenty five hours worth of training discussion we they explored all the issues and these were the the things that they felt that they were happy with and what that what this is what it says in its own words these discussions have shown there was a huge amount that could and should be done in terms of public education and awareness raising to help people engage with and understand some of the difficult issues and decisions that need to be made this needs to be a really proactive and widespread campaign so no one can miss out and this is where I think art comes back in, because as we've shown that how we can engage people through nature, engaging engagement, building engagement in environmental issues is incredibly hard. Um, different things trigger different people. So we have some people who are really concerned about litter, as you'll see by the success of things like our beach cleans. You have other people who are really concerned about the effects on, on habitats, or wildlife or um, or uh, the impacts that rising prices and things have on the poorest in our society. So it's about using art. We Art is one of our uh, the bows that we can have, um, which will really help us um, engage people so that we can start to inspire them to do a bit more and to get this 60% behaviour change that we're going to need. Um, so that's it from me. Um, so if you've got any questions, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, can I just say, I love the uh, picture behind you. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, created by uh, a local artist. <laughs> very good. Excellent. Um, okay, so we have questions. I'll take questions from in and inside and outside of the committee. Uh, Councillor uh, Desaram. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, uh, good morning to you, Catherine. A very excellent presentation. Um, I'm happy to say that I was, I was one of the many councillors that did the seven-hour carbon literacy yes, training yes. so i feel totally empowered <laughs> and able to give more positive and thoughtful decisions on this matter i just yes. wanted to quickly touch on your comments you made about evs are not the answer i wonder whether whether the thg under its climate conversations phase two which is going to look at it whether you could use art to get people to think of other ways to use their transport, such as public transport, as I think um, Councillor Faithful touched on that very earlier uh, in the meeting. And I think um, what, what you're saying is correct, that we want to try and get more people out of the car and, and possibly get electric vehicles not being the answer. But the question is, how do we persuade them? And do you feel that you'll be able to work closely with THG to promote and publicise the events that are particularly relevant to your area of expertise? Uh, thank you, Cathy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, so, you know, we need improved, rejigged bus services. We need more, you know, people active travel. One of the things that I've got some funding for this year is to put in some additional bike parking. You know, I can't make segregated cycle lanes. I can't, I can't make, you know, one-way systems. I can't make the, the town safer to cycle in. But what I can do um, is I can help remove an additional challenge. And one of that is sometimes there's not enough parking. Through the through the work that we're doing with the, um, you know, um, uh, sorry, I've just completely, bear with me, I've lost my point there. Um, so I can do some of those things. Um, and what was your other question, please, Bruce? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. No, um, it was just generally how, how you were going to use arts, the forum to, to get, um, yeah, to have the climate conversations. Yes, of course. So 
we did some stuff last year. They, uh, we were with um, the amazing Anna and Ruth came to um, the Plastic Free Festival that was held at Sideshore. Um, and um, so I was able to be there. So they did these amazing workshops with the children where they were making wild flower seed bombs. Um, and then I have a little stall with uh, our climate change action plan. And so I get to talk to the adults while the children are sat there. Um, we I was at a, a talk that we did um, just before Christmas where we had one of our community groups at uh, the Terry Jeeveson's amazing art show. Um, and then uh, we will we are going to be working together this year. The other thing that I've also brought in is we're going to have um, June. You hear it here first. It's going to be East Devon S Sustainability Month. Um, and we're going to have a whole series of events that are going on across the county, across the district, rather, I think after nearly two years of everyone being really good and following the rules and doing what they should do that the, it's going to be a bumpy year for for community action I think people are going to want to get out there um, and you know that whole term the idea of bouncing back I absolutely think the community are going to want to bounce back and I want to capture and support all that greatness I think you know together we're stronger um, and uh, so I would love that um, if we could um, uh, so we will be working with Alma Hubbard Gabbard gallery in that as well. Wonderful, Catherine. I, I think that June sounds an absolutely fantastic idea. And I think uh, hopefully it'll be great for tourism as well. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, as you said, everyone's been so concerned over the last couple of years that um, you, you, you have timed it right. And, and I think I can only welcome that sort of thing. Oh, thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you, Chair. I always feel quite inspired when I listen to um, Catherine speak on, on these issues. And I think we're really lucky to have her at this authority. And I think it's a testament as well to the new administration for, um, for making sure we appoint a climate change officer because it feeds into every single aspect of our work and it includes culture. Um, as an Exmouth member, I get so frustrated. We have the superb accessory trail, cycle trail. Um, it's a great, bicycle co commuting route and yet our, our roads are completely clogged up with, um, with commuter traffic. Um, reducing our carbon footprint cannot just be done by, by force, it has to be, it needs to be done by, by inspiring behavioural change and I think as, as Catherine really eloquently and, and quite powerfully put over in, in, in her presentation, art and culture plays a really significant role and this can't just be sort of an illustration of a bus or a bike on a lamppost or a, <laughs> or a wall <laughs> it has to be more powerful than that and I think that with the culture team we have and the the community we have within East Devon and the people that we have we can create that we can create that kind of thing um Sideshore I think it was mentioned I'm a director of Sideshore declare an interest not the forum but I think Sideshore can play an instrumental role I think we have we have um we have powerful partners it's interesting as well we have um our local plan we're thinking about at the moment there's a there's a there's a part of that that is coming up at the next meeting where we're talking about uh, community buildings which I would presume includes uh, cultural buildings and, and it's saying you know should these be in remote locations or should they be near to someone's I like the idea of them being in remote locations. People cycle to them, uh, put, 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 put them in, put some little art galleries in the middle of cycle routes. I really like that idea. So I think there's a big connect. I think there's a really big connection between our net zero uh, activities and our reducing our carbon footprint and our, and our culture strategy. So I really welcome the fact, Chair, that we have this report within this Arts and Culture Forum and long, and long may this continue. And I, I, I look forward to seeing some inspiring some inspiring art because my god i think i think as catherine's point pointed out if we get, we need to take some pretty urgent action people need to change their habits urgently and quickly and we need to be inspiring people to get out of the car and start cycling to work and as an exmouth councillor and resident i think it applies to my town perhaps more than any other with within the district there's so many people driving to uh, to exeter clogging up our roads so Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks very much, Catherine, for a really good presentation. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Um, I think what we're taking from both of those points is that, um, and I'm sure this would have been the case anyway, but the keeping the climate change agenda as a key part of the cultural strategy going forward is going to be vital. But I'm sure that was going to happen anyway. 
Um, Councillor Vicky Johns. Thank you, Chair. Hello, Catherine. Welcome to East Devon District Council. Yeah, poor soul. Um, I, I agree with what we're trying to do as a council. I do agree. But I do need to think that we really need to remember that we live in a rural area, a farming community area, and an area with an advancing elderly population. Yep. So as much as we would like to encourage people to stop the usage of their cars, etc., we probably have an awful lot of disabled badge holders, etc., that live within East Avon. Plus, we are all painfully aware of the, how do I tactfully say this, uh, not very good public transport links that we have. <laughs> now, I don't live in a town. I live in a very small rural community with 80 houses. And we have advocated for the buses that run from Honiton to Exeter and go through Cranbrook to run more, uh, not more regularly because they come home every half hour now, which is great. But I think we have one at seven o'clock and then the next one's at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a youngster with a job in Exeter, you've got no chance of getting a bus back. Yeah. You know, if you've got an after university, college, whatever. Yeah. So you need a car or some vehicle uh, or some description. Yeah. Our buses aren't the, they do their best mm -hmm. and I shall leave it at that. But we're also painfully aware that the bus prices for a rural bus, I mean, you're looking at between six and eight pounds per person yep. to get from where I live into Exeter. And it takes you an hour mm -hmm. and it drops you off in the heart of Exeter. So if you need to go somewhere else, it takes you forever to get anywhere. Yep. And the reason that I've been advised, and it's only what I've been, what I've been advised, that our bus prices are so expensive is because of the amount of bus passes that we have. So proportionally, we have an elderly population that live down here that are entitled to bus passes. I don't begrudge them a bus pass at all. But the other half of that is that the younger population end up paying and subsidising for those bus passes, which is why in London, et cetera, where they've got more transport links, et cetera, their buses are so much cheaper. They've got the tubes, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to take that into account. We can't just keep pushing people to cycle. I would not cycle from my house to Exmouth. I would barely cycle from my house to Honiton. I take my life in my hands, taking my car out. Mm. because of the lorries the buses etc mm -hmm. there's no way that I'm going to risk you know when the time eventually comes hopefully the long run that I get grandchildren I'm going to encourage them to cycle from my house into the local town they won't make it um electric cars are exceptionally expensive to buy hybrid cars are exceptionally expensive to buy and personally until they make it so that electric cars have to make some sort of noise so that residents can hear them approaching I'm not a great advocate of them anyway Personally, I've almost stepped out a couple of times when I've not heard a car coming because it's an electric car and you can switch off the sound on them, can't you? So you don't hear it approaching. At least I hear a bicycle or a normal car coming. Um, and I think it needs to start from the top. Government legislation needs updating. It needs to take into account Zoom meetings, which as a council we are running, but we have to refer to the officers, which I've got no problem with. We've got fantastic officers. I trust them implicitly. But that's not the point. The point is, until government legislation is updated so we can allow for Zoom meetings, etc. And the issue that I think that I have, and I, and I agree with all of the work that you're doing, Catherine, and I, and I back you completely. We're being told by people in positions of authority, shall I say, that we need to cut our cloth to suit. Mm -hmm. These are people with second homes that we're paying for that we're paying for their electricity, we're paying for their gas, we're paying all their expenses, et cetera, and we're paying for their transport, but we have to cut our cloth. People are not stupid. And they get into the stage where they're looking and going, well, why should I bother if they're not doing it? And it's very hard to advocate that we encourage people to do the stuff that we know is correct, regardless mm -hmm. of what those in positions of power are doing, if those in the positions of power are just paying no attention to it whatsoever. So I agree with you completely. And I think that one of the only ways around it is for all district councils and county councils to lobby members of parliament and insist that they lead from the top because they haven't done a very good job so far. You make thank some you. very good, you make some really good points there and um, thank you for bringing them up. And, and absolutely, I personally don't like electric vehicles. I think they are gonna be the future for at least the moment, especially in rural Devon. I, the last thing I want is people trapped and confined to their homes because they can't get out. We know the effect that that has on people and absolutely, and, and they are going to be a transitional tool. 
at the moment. And I would like to see that time while we are using them as a tr transitional tool to really look at our public transport system and make it fit for the kind of the new generation and the way that we're going to need it to be. That is a long old process. And, you know, I, I pity the fool that takes that job on because that's, that's one hell of a task, but you know, I'm sure we will get there when it comes to, um, you know, we are with the zoom stuff. We are absolutely, we're in the middle of the work smart review at the moment where we're really trying to take the best that we've learned from this. And, you know, from a staff point of view, us working from home from a carbon point of view has been fantastic, you know, and I think that this, this, we, you know, two years ago, if you'd have asked your boss if you could have worked at home, they'd have said, no, it'll never work. We can't possibly make it happen. Now we're all working at home. We've demonstrated this. The leap that we must be taking technologically is, is going to be huge. And it's going to be interesting to see how this shakes itself out sort of as we go further down the line. But I think that, you know, Zoom and, and some of these carbon reduction measures are definitely here to stay. And when it comes to leading from the front, you are absolutely right. You know, we, we have you know, there is uh, an absolute need for that. Um, and one of the things I'm really keen to see is that actually, I can't change the way that some people choose to behave. But what I can do, hopefully, is to try and influence some of the people who are in my orbit. Um, and we have coming soon, we've got some fantastic staff awareness raising sessions, where we're going to try and help our staff. But also things like we've made a commitment now to have co-cars, um, three co-cars that will be available for officers and staff to use so that we are not using um, sort of polluting vehicles to get around. Um, it's only three it's only a year-long trial but we are really trying to lead from the front and to demonstrate uh, you know I get sick of people like you know Leonardo DiCaprio did a fantastic film Don't Look Up and then the next day he's pictured you know in Saint-Tropez on a yacht you know uh, and you know you just think I don't want to take advice from someone who says one thing and does another and, and that's something that we are um, very aware of and um, you know you will see more on this topic as, as we go on thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, what I would say is I, I, I wish that as an arts and culture forum, we should solve all of these things. But yes. um, <laughs> the things we can't, I think maybe from now on, we can think about the link between the arts and climate change. Yeah. But um, <laughs> thank you, Councillor uh, Johns, um, for your passionately made points. Um, Councillor Arnott. Thank, thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me to speak on the forum. Um, and glad to be back in this meeting as, as, as fast as I could. Uh, just like to start off with the uh, comments made earlier in praise of THG and all the outreach work they're, they're doing there. Fantastic. So the arts and propaganda is an interesting one, isn't it? Um, um, at one extreme, it's the work of Goebbels and the kind of uh, work that he commissioned uh, work of the Soviet state, the kind of official state art they commissioned as well. So it's a controversial area when you try and use the arts as a, as a tool. But I think in this case, it has to be done. But we have to be very careful how it is, how it is put into practice. So um, I was very pleased that Catherine just mentioned the film, Don't Look Up. So not everybody will have seen it because it's on Netflix. Please try and see it. It isn't so much about, well, it's obviously it's about a meteor coming to Earth and the absolutely facile way in which the world reacts, uh, unable to prevent their own, their own ultimate doom. Um, people take it as a, as a parable about climate change. What it actually is, is a parable about the way in which the story and the media twist the reaction to make us all effectively infirm and impotent, which brings me to the subject of climate change deniers. And we have them. No, we, we have them, if I'm very, very honest with you, Chair. We have them, we have them on our own, you know, amongst our own membership as well. We have, you know, great enthusiasts for the life and works of Nigel Lawson and all of his uh, all of his uh, all of his chums and the oil lobby um, so what I love about what Catherine is suggesting is that this isn't going to be didactic telling people what to think it is offering engagement through the arts which gives an opportunity to widen and broaden discussion because in my experience that is the way in which minds are developed and perhaps ultimately changed 
we have to be aware of the counter reaction, the counter revolution constantly. The climate change um, denying lobby has not gone away. It'll always be there. It's there in East Devon, as I said to you, Chair, it is there um, in our council as well. So we have to be vigilant. And that's why I'm so delighted we have Catherine there kind of on the lookout. Now, as far as the June Sustainability Month campaign is concerned, this is a fantastic idea. And what I'd like to offer Catherine is the complete commitment of this administration to back you as much as we can. The other area we've developed a lot in the last few months is our communication strategy. Uh, we've been able to hire more people uh, to uh, replace um, uh, vacant positions. We're getting very strong, increasingly strong on digital communications uh, month on month. Um, the messages that I can't I can't work out how to stop them turning up on my Facebook page, but the messages from East Devon about waste and recycling are fantastic and they're incredibly progressive. I'd like to see more of that and I'd like to see us use our own newsletter as well. I think there's always a space for item six for something thoughtful about uh, climate change, climate action and Catherine's work as well. So I very much back that. So... Just to say, Catherine, anything we can do <clears throat> as an administration to help you and other offices to make the June Sustainability Month a success, particularly around the communications, please ask, and you know, we'll we'll be there for you. And more more power to your to your uh, elbows, both of them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. No, that's really that's really great. And uh, uh, I it, it's uh, it's an emerging idea at the moment. It's only two weeks old. I'm just, you know, exploring it in its entirety. But I will certainly be in touch um, as the time approaches. Thank you. Good to know that uh, Councillor Arnott has both of your elbows in mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm a bit curious how, how we connect with uh, art with so many of the climate things but talking on that subject I think the chair was been alluding to the fact that basically we're at East Devon we're a district council we're not a county council and it's it's really county council that deals with transport all we can do is lobby county council to get the things that we want um as far as exmouth and you know, get people off the road i think a second platform at exmouth would make an enormous difference because you should be able to uh, double the trains i think you'd be able to get them every 15 minutes instead of every half hour which would make a difference i would think but um yeah i think it's we we need to recognize that devon county is the one that does has the real say so we need to get the message to them. Anyway, I'm still a bit puzzled how we where the art comes into it, but I'm sure we'll, I'm sure Ruth and all that will manage to get somewhere with it. Thank you very much, Councillor Faithful. Um, Councillor Miller. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come back, Chair. I think it's an interesting comment made by the leader there about art as propaganda. It, it does raise an interesting issue. I think. In the case of Goebbels and the Soviet Union, this was obviously done top down by a by a totalitarian state for um, for its own reasons. I think I think what would be great here is um, artwork led by residents but facilitated by the council on an issue that is literally going to save help save the planet. Um, I'd quite like to uh, bring us back to to, to this sort of almost essay question for the Arts and Culture Forum, how are we going to facilitate this? So can we, I mean, where's the first can we, I mean, can where's the first thing? Can, can we set a budget within the climate change budget, for example, uh, to facilitate this? Because I'm aware that there might not be a budget available. So from my point of view, I'd, I'd like to see some action when it comes to um, moving this forward, a lot of local artists, a lot of artists to, um, to try to move this forward. Sorry, there's a bit of feedback. Yeah. Yeah. 
Could everybody? Ah, uh, there we go. I think that might. Carry on, Councillor Miller. I think I've finished my point. I don't know whether everybody heard it, but there was quite a lot of feedback there. So, yeah, no, I think we've. Um, I, I, I think we heard that. Um, Catherine, did you want to come back on that in terms of? Yeah, no, absolutely. We 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 do have a budget. We are looking for for projects, um, and um, uh, it's definitely something that Ruth and I um, we we've got meetings planned actually um, shortly to to discuss this. And um, you know, we we are also very good at kind of making a little go a really long way and kind of really you know. So uh, we have this in hand, and um, we will be updating as as we get a bit further down the line. Good to hear, uh, Ruth. Hi, um, I'm really heartened to hear all the enthusiasm and I just wanted to clarify that the Climate Conversations um, brand programme is exactly that, is exactly what, the, the, what we're asking for, it's the marriage of climate and arts programming. So we've been doing that since 2021 with our uh, environmental exhibitions looking at recycling, our current exhibition at the moment, which is looking at fishing. Um, so we've, Catherine's addition to the council has been absolutely brilliant in giving us credibility, but I'm sure you've seen the start of what we've been doing with the creative resources, where we work with resource futures up in London to develop worksheets and activity sheets and fact sheets. So it, it's not actually going to be such a leap to get where we want to be. We've already, for a council, got a really dynamic program set up and an infrastructure between Catherine and, and THC, but also Worldly 7 and, and, and AOMB, we'll be able to do something really, really special for the district. That's great, Ruth. Thank you very much. And that's good to hear. And, um, I, you know, we look forward to having an update at the next meeting from, from all of you. Um, OK, uh, I would now like to apologise because it appears that in the room next door, they started doing some kind of drum workshop. <laughs> so I'll keep muted where I can. Um, so uh, we now move on to agenda item 11, um, the Blackdown Hills AOMB Arts and Culture Update, and we will receive a presentation from Tim Youngs. Tim. Great. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'll just share my screen, if I may. Um, share. Hopefully yeah, you can I see think. that okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much for the invite um, to come along today. I'm, I'm Tim Youngs, I'm the manager of the Blackdown Hills AUMB. Um, I'm aware we haven't got very long, so I'll give you a whistle-stop tour. Um, and really what, uh, it might appear to be jumping around, but what I'm hoping to do is just to uh, give you a flavor of how we weave art and culture into our work in East Devon and beyond. So, I'm sure you know the geography, but just in case not. So the largest chunk, we've got four districts in the Blackdown Hills AUMB. The largest chunk of it is in East Devon. We've also got part of Mid Devon. We've got South Somerset and Somerset West and Taunton. So we've got two, two counties, four districts. Um, yeah, and like other AUMBs, pretty small team, uh, just over three full-time equivalents. Um, our core function largely pivots around the statutory AOMB management plan. Um, we've obviously got the National Landscapes Glover Review happening as we speak, um, which could change the way we do things, hopefully in a good way. Uh, nature and climate crisis has been a big priority for us, uh, particularly um, over the last couple of years, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And yeah, we're big on collaborations, as you might expect. So I can talk about that as well. Um, so we also have um, some of our own, uh, albeit small amounts of money to help support projects. So we've got play, projects like Wild Play and Underway and work on the Hazel Dormouse. So we, and they've included um, <clears throat> community gardens, willow sculptures, et cetera, et cetera. So every year we, we have a small fund um, and through COVID, we've had something called our, a challenge. We've had our own challenge fund grants up to five thousand pounds. So we've got some really good nature and climate projects coming through that. Um, and then inclusion and diversity is pretty much we through everything we do. But we know we've got a lot, a long way to go. Um, so we have um, 
yeah, we're in the north of the area more. We run um, a Somerset Nature Connections project that we're hoping to extend down into Devon. And then we've, we've got a big climate change adaptation project on the west of the area connecting the Culm. And we've done work with 450 school children um, co-creating plans for what a more resilient Culm catchment could look like. Um, um, so and we're also doing um, quite a detailed inclusion and diversity review of our partnership at the moment uh, with recommendations on what we could do better. Um, so Emma touched on this earlier. So all the AUMBs have signed up to the, what we call the Colchester Declaration, which is our commitment to nature recovery. Also covers climate and people as well. Um, so that was um, <clears throat> that was set up in July 2019, and we've been working really hard um, since, um, as East Devon AUMB have and others, uh, to produce a nature recovery plan. And one thing we've done is some visualization. So we've we've um, this is we've taken a typical chunk of the Blackdown Hills AOMB, um, set out the features that make it special and why it's designated as a nationally important landscape. But then we've also started to um, illustrate what a future resilient and nature rich Blackdown Hills landscape could look like. So I, I call it the direction of travel. So you know where where do we want to be uh, moving our, our rivers, hedges, spring line mires and archaeological sites, you know, what to, to make them a better into a better condition, make them more resilient, connect them up again. Um, so we want, you know, it's predominantly a farmed landscape, thriving communities, but it's got these uh, reconnected features. So, so that's woodlands and hedges. This is grassland and mires, and these uh, visualizations have been very effective in engaging people to, to have the debate, you know, is this, does this go far enough um, in terms of woodland cover um, and restoring habitat, or um, is it too ambitious? And we think, you know, the, the debate generally has been, it's probably about right. Um, and then moving, moving on, um, uh, last year was our 30th year. Uh, we're only established in 1991. And we work with Emma, who's on the call, to develop um, yeah, 30 ways to better experience the Blackdown Hills AUMB. And I just thought I'd share some of these because they're really fantastic resources if you haven't seen them. So the first um, theme was around hill forts, of which there are many um, important examples in the Blackdown Hills. So what Emma did working with us was um, created a series of activities, effectively a series of stories about, um, about these magical places, these hill forts, you know, why they're special, um, what people could do um, in terms of activities, and then yeah, space for people's thoughts as well to add. So I'll move through these because there's a whole series of them. They're on our website as well. Uh, yeah, one on woodlands as well. So again, picking out some examples of um, accessible woodlands. So some of them, number four, you probably can't see it on the map, but Coombwood is very close to Honiton. So it's also about how do we draw people out of the towns like Honiton? Um, they may not have a car, but you know, woods that are accessible and open to all. And then there's there's a series of activities on on the woodland, the place based. Um, examples that we've given all across the Black Downs. Uh, and then one on expansive views. Um, don't need to tell you really how, how amazing the views are from uh, various viewpoints looking up or down. Um, so again, some uh, all the way from the Wellington Monument, um, Luppet and Clay Hyden, including dark skies as well. So yeah, so as I say, if you haven't um, seen them, I'll um, go on our website. If you have any problems, give me a shout. I can go through them with you. Um, yeah, moving swiftly on again um, into art and culture links to the historic environment. So there's a really important Cistercian Abbey at Dunk as well that um, many of you know uh, of it probably, but also many people don't know about it. And it's um, yeah, really important site. That photograph shows an aerial shot of it. 
It's a schedule monument at risk. So we've um, worked with um, on a monument management scheme with volunteers to help restore it. But I thought of particular interest was this visualization because um, again, if you haven't seen it, this is just phenomenal how what, what Dunkerswell Abbey used to look like in the 12, 1300s, 1400s, as well with its medieval fish ponds, et cetera. So we worked with a local artist to um, reimagine or um, revisualize re actually what, what it looked like in its, in its full glory. And obviously if you go there now, um, there are some walls and remnants, but um, we've used this as a tool really. Um, in fact, the, yeah, the orange shading, if you can see it is what's left now. Uh, the rest of it was obviously much more extensive. So yeah, give me a shout again, if you want any more detail on these. Uh, yeah, Creative Cabin has been mentioned by Ruth already. So we, um, it, it had a road show around parts of the Black Downs that it hadn't reached before. Uh, we did some war work together at Columpton as part of the Connecting the Colm project. So it's, and we've had, yeah, Ruth's done various other exploratory visits with the cabin into new venues. So we're very keen to, um, to, to uh, you know, help um, bring it more into the hills, into the Blackdown Hills. Um, and then, yeah, we've done joint events. I think this is one at Columpton with, um, alongside the Creative Cabin and the Connecting the Colm project, talking to people about catchments and water and what it means to them, et cetera, et cetera, engaging young people. Um, and yeah, just briefly, the last bit was just onto the, um, the Robert Bevan and Camden Town artist work in the early 1900s. I showed a couple or three years ago at the similar meeting actually. And so we had a, a really exciting meeting with Tim Craven, who I think is part of the London group and Ruth talking about bringing an exhibition or well, they wanted to bring an exhibition to the Thelma Holbrook Gallery in 2023. Um, and we formally had an exhibition in, on, in Taunton Museum about four years ago. So if you haven't seen this artwork before, um, it's absolutely fascinating, really. So it sets, you know, it's an impressionist view of, of the landscape 100 years ago from a lot of um, areas around Luppet, but also further north in the Blackdown Hills. Just some fa fantastic images. Also, we did some before and after work a few years ago. So some houses and landscapes haven't really changed very much. Others have changed. Um, so there's a whole series of stories to tell around that. Um, yeah, some lo lovely images. I'm not sure exactly where these are. Some of them are definitely Luppet. Um, yeah, old farmsteads as well, where you can see um, not much has changed. Um, and then, uh, yeah, another house as well. So, sorry, I'm rattling through this because of time. So, so where, where are we going in the next 12 months? So, as I say, working with Thelma Holbert, if I've said that right, team on, on the climate conversations and um, Camden Town exhibition next year. Um, yeah, we're at... There's an art in the landscape strategy that the National Association of AOMBs uh, launched, and we're embedding that into all our work. Um, working with partners to increase outreach work and support their aspirations for Wilder Devon, groups like Child Stock. Um, yeah, engaging more artists and makers in our projects, hopefully providing benefits for local tourism businesses and I've just added an extra one on here. We did some explore and create videos <clears throat> through lockdown, which have been really well taken up. It's for ways to explore heritage and nature, etc. And they're all on our website as well. Um, so feel free to browse those. So uh, that was it from me. Thank you. Hope I haven't run over. Uh, stop no, that's fine. Uh, do we have any? Thank you very much for that, Tim. That's really interesting. Does uh, do we have any questions for Tim at all, uh, Councillor Faithful? Thank you, Chair. Um, we've just been talking about climate change, and to me, there's potential for pump storage hydroelectricity across the whole of these areas. Um, I think we should be encouraging 
energy provision across the district and not focusing it all on the, the West End because, you know, there's a, a huge potential in there. Um, I think they should be done in a way that protects the appearance and the features of the area. But to me, I think we're, we're throwing away an opportunity by all this great protection of Blackdown and East Devon AOMBs by having nothing nothing going on there. Um, thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, again, arts and culture, probably quite a difficult thing for us to achieve, but um, Charlie? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, Chair, just to say thanks, Tim. That was a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation and I know um, Ruth has been delighted with the collaboration um, that uh, you guys have been working on and a conversation we we're having actually yesterday that there's plenty more scope um, to sort of nurture and develop that relationship. And it also just very timely, um, the sort of cultural heritage elements, you know, are, are something that strike a chord. I know within the East Devon A1B project, um, A1B team as well. And it's, you know, really important that we don't lose sight of um, you know, that side of our arts and culture uh, work as well, our work programme. So um, I just want to say thanks. Um, really, really interesting. Looking forward to uh, future collaborations. I know you pinged me an email um, whilst we've been online, you know, just to follow up um, some of the areas raised today and absolutely 100%, you know, I'll respond to that and look forward to, um, you know, helping support you. And, and likewise, you know, because of the nature of the partnership chair, you know, with the sort of split, Obviously, with the Somerset Arm um, authorities and um, and East Devon, we're going to make sure we give Tim you know every opportunity, the sort of platform to tell us about you know the, the, the fantastic work that um, you know his team are doing in the Blackdown Hills. It really is. Um, a lot of it's really cutting edge stuff. Um, so um, thanks for, very much again, Tim. Hey, Charlie, uh, Councillor Hookway. Thank you, Chair, and thank also to Tim for an absolutely fascinating presentation about the Black Downhills. I had no idea that the area was so interesting, absolutely. Most of the time I get near to the Black Downhills and I'm driving past them going north to see relatives. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just struck really, when we've been, we've been talking about culture, we've talked about culture in Exmouth, we've talked about culture issues in Cranbrook, and now we're looking at culture issues in the areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, Ruth talked about cultural ecology, and quite honestly, I can't imagine how a broad a subject in terms of culture and its ecology that we've got in East Devon. We must have got more cultural issues than many cities, I think, in, um, in, in many ways. There are so many things going on that we could talk about uh, and use um, and debate and um, lead on with climate change as well. But I think it is this morning's been absolutely fascinating and uh, a real eye opener for me even at my age um so um thank you very much indeed to everybody who's contributed it's been a very worthwhile meeting for me thank you chair that's all i've got to say you're not thank, that you very, old. thank you very much Mr. Hooker, councillor miller i just said you're not that old nick oh. yeah i've got many years on you chum <laughs> you, you young webber snappers right okay thank you again to tim and to everybody who's going today um at this point, uh, that brings our meeting to an end. And I'd like to thank everybody for taking part, including members of the public for their attendance. Uh, members, can I remind you that until the Democratic Services team confirm that, the confirm that the live streaming recording has stopped, you can still be seen and heard and any comments may be recorded. Um, thank you all very much. That was a really great meeting, I think, and well worth um, us all attending. And I look forward to the next one, which hopefully will not be uh, quite so long in the in the uh, in the waiting. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, officers. Thank you, chair. Thank you, Nick. I have to run off now to take part in the drum workshop. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank Joe. you all. I look forward Cheers, to the.